instead of the Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We're uh, having a few more difficulties with technology uh, this Sunday morning, June 14th, 2020. So I wasn't able to figure out a way to uh, stream from the Smith Cove Baptist Church page. So we're streaming this morning from my own personal page and hopefully that this is getting through. Is uh, anything on there, Nikki? Is it starting? Okay, so that's a good sign. It's we're making it up there in the airways. So blessings to you all this morning. Um, it's kind of interesting that uh, I have a little announcement, a housekeeping item to make uh, regarding the live stream. And here I was having troubles uh, this morning, but someone had mentioned that when they try to get on the live stream each week that there's a, it takes a bit of time to connect to the stream. And uh, so they end up missing uh, the first few minutes of the message. So starting next week, uh, Hopefully uh, we'll be able to get things fixed and then I'll be starting the live stream with a, an, an empty pulpit. So just wait a minute or so uh, before we start. And then uh, so when you tune in, if there's no one there at the pulpit, be patient because we'll, we'll get after it in just a moment. So uh, welcome to you all this morning. I got some scriptures to share with you. Uh, uh, both our readings this morning are from the Old Testament. The first is from Genesis chapter 12. I'm reading verses one to three. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And you fast forward uh, a few hundred years, and we have our reading from the prophet of Isaiah chapter 42, I'm reading verses one to nine. Isaiah writes, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teachings, the islands will put their hope. This is what the God, the Lord of Israel says, the creator of heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out on the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand, I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open your eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon your word this morning and, and the message that uh, you would open our hearts and minds to receive this into our spirit and souls. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, I had delivered a message about our hearing problem. Not that we can't hear, but as humans, especially sinful humans, we seem to be hard of hearing when it comes to listening to God through his word, the prophets, and especially his Holy Spirit. In some of my earlier live stream messages, I've given you some of the basics about how the nation of Israel, the Jewish people came to be, how the Bible has recorded their origins and how Israel plays a very crucial and major part in our futures as a human race. This morning, I hope to recap these origins and hopefully point uh, all of us to the future, a future for the whole world. At the moment, the whole world wonders where it's going and what shall become of us. Since the closure of, uh, closure of our church in March, uh, my pastoral duties have changed a lot, just like a lot of other pastors. There's no home or hospital visits, and certainly, for me anyway, fewer funerals and, and such, thus leaving me with some extra time on my hands. And I've taken advantage of that time to catch up on some reading. There's a lady from our church, I won't mention her name, 
but she had been giving me some books, not just one or two, but I think if I added them all up now, there'd be a dozen or more books. They are different offers, but a few of the books have the same author, and I've been amazed at what I've been learning. I've even ordered more books and have been reading some of these, uh, some, uh, some of these authors, that, and I've spent a good deal of time uh, reading and discussing the books with people who I've kind of loaned these books out to after the fact. Some of what I've been taken in, it seems that it makes its way into the messages that I've been sharing. Statements like, there's nothing in the Bible that's not important. It's all there for a reason. And in particular, the Old Testament stuff that, you know, we have the tendency to think that that doesn't apply to us because we're not Jewish. I suggested to those who haven't got a great deal of biblical knowledge to start reading their Bibles in the New Testament. And I found, as I look back, I preach mainly from the New Testament. But I still think that it's a good idea for new believers to start in the New Testament. But the Old Testament has so much to, uh, for us to take in and to help us understand the New Testament and our present day and future. An example is when I shared a couple of weeks ago for the Pentecost messages, the, the similarities of the first Passover and Pentecost, those events that took place in the Exodus, to the crucifixion of Jesus, who was crucified over Passover, and then the arrival of the Holy Spirit 50 days later at Pentecost. The Old Testament isn't just a bunch of history. It points us towards Christ. The holy days that God had given Israel has fulfillment in the New Testament and for our futures as well. It's stunning, Ashley, and I can't fathom how I hadn't recognized or realized the significance of this in the past years. It's likely many senior pastors who have been around longer than I have They've known this stuff for many years, but I, I don't recall being taught how relevant the Old Testament holy days, those feasts, how relevant they are to us in our day and age, even though we're not Jewish. Okay, so I need to focus on today's message. In short, we have to admit that we're hard of hearing, but when it comes to listening to God, all of us as believers, and especially those pre-Christians who haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, so let's listen to what God has been saying. It's not just history, but much of what God has had the Spirit give to us in the Old Testament scriptures. It's very relevant for us, for you and I today. As Christians, we've been wondering when Jesus will return. As humans, whether we are believers or not, if our heads are not completely in the sand, we can see that our world and our society is in serious trouble. So when is Jesus coming back? Nope, you're not gonna get that answer from me. But as we've been given things in scripture to watch for and the place to start uh, paying attention to is this little nation in the Middle East called Israel. And concerning prophecy, my dad always told me, he says, Mark, if you want to know when things are getting close to Jesus' return, pay attention to what's happening in the Middle East and especially Israel. For those of you who don't watch the news, well, even if you do, since Trump became president, since impeachment hearings, and since COVID-19, the tragedies that we've been dealing with in our province and in our own country, uh, and now this global uh, social uprising against racism, it's hard to find any other news other than what these big things that are going on. But lower in the headlines, there's stuff going on concerning Israel that will have an effect on the future of our world. Now, before I get to that, Let's visit those Old Testament scriptures that I had shared earlier to set the foundation as to what's to happen in our futures. First of all, way back in Genesis chapter 12, we find God, he's choosing Abraham. His name uh, is Abram, but it later gets changed to Abraham. And, and, he, and he is just this one human out of all the tribes and people of the earth. And God chooses Abraham to be the father of a great nation. The nation will end up being the nation of Israel. And it will be through Israel, the Jewish people, that God will send his servant and his salvation will come to the Jews through Jesus. That's the Jewish nation. And the same salvation will be given to all nations, to all those who are not Jewish. That's us, the Gentiles. So that's a short description of where Israel has its roots some 4,000 years ago. And as we rewind a bit, God has made this promise to Abraham. In verse 2, uh, of Genesis 12, he says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. 
I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. And then in verse three, we find that God declares something that we need to keep in mind. He says, I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. Yet all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. God's command is that as a nation or people, as they interact with God's chosen nation, Israel, that he's going to create through Abraham. If a particular nation is good to Israel, they will be blessed. If they are nasty to Israel, the outlook won't be so great. That's a promise from God and one that many a nation uh, since has found to be true. If you support Israel, your nation will be blessed. Evidence of this in the past hundred years or so is that of the Ottoman Empire, who wasn't nice to the Jewish people. And as the First World War took down the 400 year old Ottoman Empire, then the British became the most powerful nation in the world. And at the time, it was the British who was initially had planned a separate nation to be called Israel in the Middle East. Their help for Israel only went so far and the British fell short of doing what they had set out to do and withdrew from some of the crucial support needed. And lo and behold, the young nation of the United States took over as the main support for Israel. And we have seen the downward power of the British uh, empire and the rising of the empire, if you want to call it, of the USA. So to help and support Israel, the nation who does, does this will be blessed. Not only the nation, but the people. If individuals support and pray for Israel, this is good and according to God's will and plan. Yet if we as individuals want to persecute or belittle the Jews, we find ourselves on the wrong side of God's will. And if you've ever wondered why the Jews and the Arabs fight so much, such hatred shown towards the Jewish people, and peace between them is never really possible, it all goes back to that promise of God to Abraham and his family and those who come after him. Abraham had a child with his maid. His name was Ishmael. He ends up being the father of Arab nations, Ishmael does. But God had promised Abraham a son with his lawful wife, Sarah. Both were old and beyond childbearing years, yet Sarah gives birth to a son. They name him Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob, and God changed Jacob's name to Israel. The feud between the Jews and the Arabs begins with the Arabs trying to rewrite God's promise and the Jewish history to say that Ishmael is the true heir because he was the firstborn son to Abraham. But biblical history shows God has favored completely the son of Abraham and Sarah. That is Jacob. From Genesis onward in the Old Testament, God creates the nation of Israel. And of course, we follow along. There's rules, there's ups and downs in the relationship between holy God and sinful Israel, because of course they are human. And despite the fact that God allowed them to be punished by other nations for their disobedience to God, God being holy and true, never broke his promise to Abraham or changed any of the plans to make Israel a great nation. So if we fast forward some 1300 years, this is 700 years before Jesus, and God begins to use the prophet Isaiah to help teach and guide the people of Israel. In our reading from Isaiah 42 this morning, Isaiah is predicting the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and his role in the future of Israel and our future too. Here's a few of our, the verses, and some of them are just partial from the reading that I shared earlier. It speaks of Jesus's work on earth some 2000 years ago and the work that will continue in our future. Isaiah writes, he says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit upon him. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice and he won't falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth. The Lord, I have called you into righteousness and I will take hold of your hand and I will keep you and I will make a covenant. Remember, that's an agreement. I will make you to be a covenant for the people this is the Jewish nation that he speaks of, and a light for the Gentiles. That's us. He continues, he says, I am the Lord and that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. God announces to the world through Isaiah that Jesus will come and salvation will be for the Jews. And through the witness of the Jewish people initially, 
the disciples, the apostles, as we read in the New Testament, this same salvation will be shown to the Gentiles of the world. Remember, that's us, the non-Jewish people. So nothing changed from the promise given to Abraham to Isaiah, and nothing of the promise changed between Isaiah to Jesus. The original promise is still in effect. God chose Abraham to make a nation from him, and through that nation, the Messiah would come, and through Messiah Jesus, salvation would come to the whole world. Now, if one wants to refute God and the original promise to Abraham, that states falsely that the rear heir, uh, the real heir is Ishmael, then why is it that Jesus' genealogy doesn't trace back to Ishmael, but traces back to Jacob? See, this is one of those things, one of those times that what's written in the Bible is important, but it's the stuff sometimes we like to skip over. You know, when it says that so-and-so begat so-and-so and, and so on and so on, all that genealogy stuff we like to kind of just pass through. We can trace Jesus' human ancestry right back to Adam, but as far as the nation of Israel goes, we only need to go back as far as Abraham. So hopefully I haven't bored you with all that history lesson, but it's vitally important to understand. One more thing about the reading from Isaiah, the last verse. What did God say? He says in Isaiah 42, verse 9, he says, See the former things that have taken place, now new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God is saying here that I've already told you the history. Now I've told you things for the future before they come into reality. Why would God do that? This is the way that God shows all people that he is the one true living God. He does know the future. He predicts the future with stunning accuracy. And to all those who reject the one true living God and, and they go about life seeking other gods, gods of wood or stone, gods of money or pride or fame, or whatever other false gods of other false religions, these gods, not a single one of them can tell the future like the God of Israel has done. So why have I all shared all this? After all, the title of the message is Pay Attention to Israel. So the news that's shared with us daily on our televisions and social media. If you watch, you might notice that there's a handful of things that consume the news of the day. But at the ticker, at the bottom, it may give us a, a bit of other stuff that's going on in the world. I look at MSN every morning and, and I watch some CNN and CBC throughout the day, but on MSN, a bunch of different stuff is shown there. Much of it is useless information, but mixed in with the unimportant stuff, we can find tidbits of real events that are happening that that don't make the big headlines. And concerning Israel, that's likely to change in the coming weeks. If you watch the news, some of you know that Israel has had several elections in the past year with Benjamin Netanyahu being voted in again, but this time with a minority government. But even with the minority government, they are in agreement for Israel to begin a process called annexation. Lands that God had given Abraham as a promised land for the nation of Israel, out of all that land, Israel possesses just a fraction of it. All the Arab countries that surround Israel possess a majority of this promised land. When Israel became a nation, once again in 1948, and note that they hadn't been a nation since 70 AD, nearly 2,000 years ago. When they became a nation, it was actually a miracle. And they have fought several wars. And back in 1967, they actually took back some of the land that was promised to them by God. Another miracle. All those nations ganged up on them. Since then, to try and create peace between the Arabs and the Jews, Israel has given land back to the Palestinians, uh, places known as the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Well, giving this land has only allowed this land to be used as a place for many of the Israel's enemies to launch warfare against the small nation of Israel. So as the world encourages Israel to give more land for peace, peace that hasn't worked thus far because the Palestinians really don't want a two state agreement. They really want Israel gone. Israel has decided to take back some of this land that was previously given to the Palestinians in previous peace deals. So what does this all mean? Israel says that early in July, they'll commence to annex some of this land. And if Israel goes ahead 
with the taking back of this land, Israel is going to be in the headlines. And the vast majority of the world will not approve of what Israel is going to do or as they do it. The United States will likely back Israel politically. But have I noticed in the past few years that Canada is not in such support of Israel, especially on this issue. This future tension could easily break out into huge and serious wars. And I'm not telling this to frighten you. Have you been frightened before when wars break out in the Middle East? And maybe, likely most of you have not been aware of some of the smaller skirmishes that have been going on between Israel and its enemies next door in the recent years. But I'm telling you all of this so that you begin to keep an eye on Israel. You won't get much in the news headlines on CBC or CNN unless things really escalate. Well, all you need to do, really, if you want, is Google news about Israel. I don't have the time this morning to get into all of this, but many biblical scholars interpret scriptures to say that God is soon going to show his power and his support for Israel. God says, I will not give my glory over to another. If this soon annexation takes place, it'll create a power cake. And know that the neighboring Arab nations, they're going to be super angry. They're not going to like this at all. Maybe then they will conspire to evade, invade Israel again to eliminate them. Because many of them have publicly stated that Israel doesn't deserve to exist. Yes, that's right. A majority of the nations in the world will wish that Israel would just fade away so that there could be peace in the Middle East. There will be peace, but one has to look to the scriptures to see how that peace comes about. If any of us are going to claim that we believe in the God of the Bible, you'll need to confess that the peace won't come from a peace deal between Arabs and Jews. Israel will defeat the surrounding countries and take back land likely more than what was even anticipated, but once part of the original promised land to Abraham and his descendants. So there, that's kind of my interpretation, what I've gleaned from scripture, from scholars, the latest news headlines. And you might say, well, Mark, why talk about all this stuff? Because it scares people. Or people have been saying this kind of stuff for years that the stuff that's going on in the Middle East, well, you know, that's gonna cause some big problems someday, but." Really, nothing's happened. I said what I said because all of us need to be reminded of what God has promised Abraham, the promises to Israel, and even to us as believers in what God has said and what he has provided for us. One more thing about this prophecy stuff. One of the books I read mentioned that one of the chief reasons that the Jews had been abused and punished, hunted down, rejected, scorned over time, it goes back to a good old-fashioned story of good versus evil. God had made those promises to Abraham and his descendants who have become the nation of Israel. That's the good part, the good side. The evil part or the dark side of all of this is simply stated by saying that Satan or the devil, whatever it is that you may want to call him, if Satan can eliminate the Jews off the face of the earth, then it would have God looking weak. It would have God looking like a liar and a promise breaker. Satan has tried to rid the earth of the Jews numerous times. Satan used Pharaoh in the Exodus to kill the male born uh, children. Satan used armies of all sorts to try and wipe them out in Old Testament times. Satan thought he won the war when Jesus was crucified and died, but got a shock, I suppose, when Jesus rose from the grave. In our recent history, the Nazis tried to rid the world of the Jews. Most nations didn't approve of a homeland for God's hand-picked nation of promise. Arab countries that surround Israel are influenced by Satan to hate the Jews and to try to wipe them off the map. Those are actually words used by Arab and Muslim national leaders in the past. The future of these enemies of God in Israel is not going to be good. And a, a critic of Israel could say that God is being unjust. Well, you go ahead if you like. A critic of Israel is being critical of God, and I'm not going to be part of that camp, and I strongly encourage you not to make that mistake. And those who want to be critics of God and how this all plays out, because war is not going to be good, there will be a lot of suffering to take place. 
But if one would try and take the time to, to fathom God, to find that even though God has allowed Satan to poison people to be against Israel, God is going to be merciful to many of these Arab nations in the end. And why is that? Because they figure out one person at a time, one nation at a time, that the God of Israel is the one true living God. And they will eventually turn to God and worship him. They will accept Israel. And then as Christ rules the world, there will be real peace, eternal peace. There's a lot of war and suffering between now and then. So if you're fearful of what I've shared today, the cure for that fear is to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. You or I as believers have nothing to fear. If you want to be critical of me for sharing what I have, that's fine. But at the very least, read the Bible and discover what God has said and what he has done in the past concerning Israel. Discover what God has said about Israel's future. And if you have a problem with it all, you might want to ring up God's complaint department and see if he approves of your wanting to rewrite God's will. And let me know how that all turns out for you. Forgive me for being sarcastic, but I'm no biblical prophet of old. I'm no political scientist and I'm no military uh, strategist. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ who has given us the past and future details of life before they come into re reality. And what I've shared with you this morning is things that I've gleaned from scripture, from world history, from biblical history, from the current news and, and adding all this together has many people much more holy and intelligent and educated than me as many seeing the signs that the Lord is about to wake the world up to his power and authority. So this message is not about me being right and someone else being wrong. It's about my wanting you to be informed and pleading with you to be ready for Jesus' return. We're taught in the New Testament to expect Jesus' return at any time. So are you ready to begin your eternal existence? That's why I've shared all of this, hoping and praying that you are ready. A couple of weeks ago, I had a message about how much time you or I may have left. The truth of the matter is I was writing and finishing up this message yesterday. There was no guarantee that I'd be alive today to deliver it. My life on earth could end at any moment. God has given us so much to show that he is just who he says he is. Will we listen? Will we be ready to accept him now? Will we be willing to watch Israel and pay attention to see God bring forth prophecy of centuries old to a, a reality before our very eyes? So we need not fear the future, but we embrace the God of creation, the God of Israel, the God and Father of the risen Jesus Christ, and we can look forward to the eternal future God has promised you and I who believe. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that you help us, each one, to pay attention to our world and, and what's happening. May we have our eyes opened, open to see your movement in the world and how you will be there to protect your promise given to Abraham so long ago. Lord, you have told us the history through the scriptures. You have also done what no other God can do. You have told us the future. So may your spirit guide us to see you at work in these days. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our salvation. And we praise you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, your promise to one day return for us who believe. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who guides us and teaches us. Lord, help us in our struggles. Help us, Lord, to be part of the solution in the war against injustice for all people near and far. We ask, Lord, for your protection of all those who help meet our daily, our daily needs. Bless and protect those who heal us, feed us, and protect us in our communities. Be with those, Lord, who mourn the loss of loved ones. Give them strength and comfort and the ability to cope with their changed lives. Lord, we make this prayer in your name as you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessings on your day and upon your week. And hopefully we'll have some any technical issues figured out by next Sunday. So have a great day and don't forget, show and wash your hands. <laughs>